my name is Shaban Ouko, as you may all know. I was in Jaquat. Uh, I think I will need to stop saying I was in Jaquat. See the way when you grow old, they tell you at some point you must stop saying you come from a humble background. Because now you have become the background. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't be 40 and say you came from a humble background. That is now in the past. But uh, for the purposes of protocol and to fulfill all righteousness, I was in Jaquat. Amen. I was in Jaquat 2013 to 2018. The more I come to preach in campus, uh, the more I get more and more people who are born in the 2000s. At some point, everyone will be preaching to Inaire to be born in 2000. I think at that point, now they won't be relating with my jokes because now I'll be very old school. Uh, I was in the mission's office. I was in Nairet. I was in NET. Nairet took me later on after campus. <laughs> Even you were very confused. I was in NET. I think they are on the other side. I'll be preaching there next week. I was uh, in mission's office. I was in EDIT. I was in finance committee of the CU. Uh, I was also in the EC of the CU. Those are the places where the Lord helped me to serve. And uh, nowadays I'm an associate of NIRET. We want to talk about the topic, dust your robes. Um, creativity. You know, when you, are, when, you are, when you are preaching to campus people, you don't assume the topic. Because whatever you assume and whatever they mean might be two different things. They take a lot of effort to decide which words will go where. But now they gave me six, I think, not seven objectives. And uh, when I looked at them as a preacher from a Baptist background, that is seven hours. <laughs> so I decided <laughs> I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. So I reduced them to four. I thought four hours would be a lot, but two hours would be enough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> two hours is not that bad. So if you come from a background where your pastor preaches for that minute, I'm very sorry. Uh, for me, it's a long time. So I hope we are ready to listen to the word of God. Ah, you are not ready. <laughs> we are ready. Uh, next time, please buy everyone water. Because sometimes it might be long. The general flow that we are going to use um, for this is to, there was the part of moving on, maybe because of past issues or hearts and um, forgiving people. That was the second objective, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I won't cover that part of your relationship with others. That's the part I omitted. I'm very sorry, Chair. It was too big for me. So that's the part I omitted, but the Chair is uh, more than able to handle that in the future. Um, I don't know if they were motivated by someone in the exec who was an ex that it's been difficult to move on. Now they wanted to hear what the Lord has to say about that situation. But I'm going to focus on you are God and you are sin. Praise the Lord. And I'm keen to say you are God and you are sin and to omit your righteousness because you have none. The one that you have has been imputed on you by the virtue that you are a believer if at all you are one. Amen? So that triangle has you, God, and your sin. And we are going to look at what it means to dust your robes from the perspective of trusting in God as a, a loving father, a compassionate father, a caring God, trusting in God, um, what, what David says, that he remembers our frame, he knows that we are just but dust. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And to... To have that mindset or attitude like David has when he says he had rather fall in the hands of the Lord. Amen? 
because at least he is confident that the Lord might exercise um, mercy upon him and that the mercies of the Lord might turn away the wrath of God and the judgment of God from him. Amen? And so that's the focus we are going to take. We are going to look at how we as believers should view sin and should view our position as having been forgiven our sins and how that should shape our understanding of who God is. Praise the Lord. Because our failure to do that in, in the right biblical sense will most often get you into, I'd say, two extremes. On one extreme is you will, if you do not have the right understanding of that, you will see God as a tyrannical being who, who is happy and uh, more than willing to condemn you in your sin and to damn you in it and to make you um, feel, for the lack of a better word, as though in him is just fire and brimstone. Amen? Which is not the case for believers. And on the other end, it will push you to the extreme of having some sort of laxity that kind of makes you think that God has, for some reason, lowered his standards and that now because he's a loving and caring God, you can just wallow around in sin and uh, God will still forgive you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen. So there are those two extremes. So to have that fair balance of how... Um, these things interact is quite important for us. Philippians 3 verse 13 to 14 uh, Paul says I do not count myself brethren to have apprehended but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So let's put this into context. Paul is coming from talking about um, his, how he would boast as a Jew, um, how he was the best of the Jews. But even in that, he still persecuted the church, and the church feared and trembled at the voice of Paul, or before then he was called Saul. And he comes to here to this point and he's saying he forgets those things of the past. And then he continues just after that section and he speaks about his citizenship in heaven and how as a citizen of heaven, he and consequently us as believers, we ought to behave. So he's coming from, this is where I was, I have forgotten that past, I'm pressing on towards the mark, and this is who I am now in acknowledging that he is a, a citizen of heaven, and this is how I ought to behave as a citizen of heaven. So the whole turnaround for Paul, the repentance path for Paul, is from a point of being a sinner who then the Lord saves, and then he gets to a point that he embraces um, the forgiveness of the Lord and then after that he recognizes the responsibilities that he has now as a believer or the new position that he has as a believer. Now in Acts chapter 3 verse 19 there is this speech that Peter gives a preaching and he says repent ye therefore I think it was Peter and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now here, Peter is speaking to a crowd, a crowd of largely non-believers. A majority of them are non-believers. Praise the Lord. Amen. And he is telling them that the starting point is that you repent. 
and that you be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that when the times of refreshing shall come, uh, so that for, as, as they anticipate rather the times of refreshing, which shall come from the Lord Himself. Now, he's basically telling them that they need to begin by appreciating the fact that they are sinful beings and they need to repent. They need to turn away from their sins and look to Christ so that Christ may nourish them, so that they may be counted as the children and the sons of God and the daughters of God. So, I want to assume that we are all born again here. If you are not born again, the beginning for you in this sermon is that point. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. That you first of all need to repent your sins and be converted. Because it's difficult to fully embrace um, the love of God and His forgiveness towards believers if you are not a believer. Now when Christ prays in John chapter 17, he says that um, I pray for these disciples, not these ones only, but even those that you will raise. Amen? And again in another place he says that it is the good pleasure of the Lord, God himself, that he may give the kingdom to his children. Amen? Amen? That is the pleasure of God. Ezekiel says that God does not delight or take joy or happiness in the death of a sinner. Amen? Amen. And we are reminded again in John chapter 3 from verse 17, Scripture says that those who are condemned, why are they condemned? Because they do not believe. Him whom Christ, him whom God has sent, who is Christ Jesus. Because Christ is very categorical that his coming to the earth was not to condemn. Amen? You know, there are people who spread the gospel that Christ came to condemn. I'm yet to find that in scripture. But if I am to trust the words of Christ himself, more than the words of any other person, Christ says that I have not come into the world to condemn but to save. Amen? Amen? And he goes on to say that those who are condemned they are condemned because they do not believe in me. They are not condemned because I have come for them to be condemned but it is because they do not believe in me. Amen? Amen. So if you do not believe in Christ Jesus then you are already condemned. But if you believe in Christ Jesus, you are saved from your sin and it is the good pleasure of God to give you the kingdom. And you must have that confidence as a Christian. Amen? That is the paradox of the grace of God. That, as a Titus says, that it has appeared to us, teaching us to say no to all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Amen? That the grace of God that reveals his will to give us eternal life to complete the work that he has begun in us, as Philippians would say. That grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and unrighteousness. The manifestation of any other grace that keeps you happy and comfortable in your sin is not the grace that comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen? That is a false kind of grace. But first, your repentance must start with that repentance and to conversion so that your sins may be blotted out and that you may believe in Christ Jesus. Now, there is another concept again when it comes to repentance. Awini has arrived. It looks like the Jamadrongai has been cleared. <coughs> now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 to 11, the Bible says, Now I rejoice, not that you are made sorry. The context of this is about giving and learning from the Macedonian church. 
He says, but that ye sorrowed in repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, and that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly way, what carefulness it wrought in you, yes, what clearing of yourselves, yes, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge, in all things you have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now, hear what Paul is saying. He's saying that first, that you were made sorrowful in a godly manner. Praise the Lord. Now, there's a difference between repenting and feeling sorry for yourself. Praise the Lord. Some of us, what we do is we feel sorry for ourselves every night. Amen? Or every other time, you sin around. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. someone I relate to Maybe we should be teaching about going to heaven because we are rich. Now, some of us, we are always feeling bad about ourselves and we are thinking we are repenting. Praise the Lord. You do a sin, you go, you cry, you cry, you cry, you write in your notebook. Uh, sometimes there's no, there's no need to write in your notebook all those your sins. Praise the Lord. If the heavens need to record them, they will record them. So you can be sure someone has recorded them. So you don't need to record again, today I took back and I'm very sorry about myself. And then you cry, you cry, you cry. Then one week later you are taking back. Then you come back, instead of updating the other one and writing times two, you go to another page, again you write. Today I took back and I felt sorry for myself. And you enter into that cycle of feeling sorry for yourself. Praise the Lord. Because your understanding of the gospel is flawed. Amen? Your understanding of what repentance is, it is flawed. Praise the Lord. As long as you are just engaging your emotions and thinking that by engaging your emotions and thinking that by crying and that by feeling bad about it or just finding someone and sharing it with them because you want to fulfill the scripture that says repent your sins one to, one to another and you feel that you have repented that is not what scripture says about repentance. Praise the Lord. That is not what... Scripture has not said that the true mark of repentance is you crying. Praise the Lord. It has not said that the true mark of repentance is you feeling regrettable for the things you have done. It does not say it is about you having a resolution. Praise the Lord. Repentance is not to lead you to a resolution to not do what you have done. Amen. Repentance is to turn you to Christ, praise the Lord, so that Christ can enable you to not do again that which you have done. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And he says that, Paul says that this godly sorrow works repentance to salvation because this godly sorrow, is, it has some outcomes. And this is what Paul says. It says that it brings out a fear. It brings out a vehement desire. It brings out a zeal. It brings out some indignation against sin. It brings out some strong hatred against that sin that you have fallen into. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? Some of these things that we say, which sometimes is true, that we are struggling with sin. It is true, yes, we are struggling with sin, but we have truly not repented. Praise the Lord. Because when you repent, there are some things about you that we expect to change. We are not just looking at the outward outcome of you. 
We are not just looking and saying that he used to take bath, he used to sleep around, she used to do this and that, and now she, we can no longer see her doing it, so she repented. That is all we can see for us as human beings. That is all we can measure, the fruits that you produce. But God is looking at your heart. Praise the Lord. God is trying to find whether your heart has truly felt the weight and the burden of that sin. Amen? Amen. So the next time you cry for one hour, before you leave there with a resolution not to sin, ask yourself, after you have now cried and you are back to yourself, have I truly repented? Praise the Lord. Amen. If you have not, they now start repenting. The crying session is done. Now the repentance session begins. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And these things are very important, especially for you when you're in campus, because the affinity towards sin in campus is too high. Amen? Amen. And the probability of falling back is also too high. Praise the Lord. Amen. Paul says that you have not yet struggled with sin to the point of shedding blood. Amen? You have not yet gotten to that point. So if you think your tears are enough, uh, Paul is saying there is a higher bar. You haven't struggled with sin to the point of shedding blood. So as a believer, you must understand that the outcome of your repentance is not saying I will do and I will not do. Praise the Lord. It is a heart that has been changed by God. A heart that has learned from Christ. A heart that has been pierced. A heart that has been driven with a strong hatred against that sin that you have fallen into. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's not about meeting your friend in the closed room and telling him all your sins. Because you can be back again there after two days. Or after three days again, you can be back there with the same sin. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you need to ask yourself, what is truly happening to me? What struggle am I having with this sin? So that every other time you repent, you are even struggling with it the more. Every other time you feel you are repenting, you are even struggling with it the more. Because you are just crying, but you are not repenting. Amen? We are not seeing it drawing you towards prayer more. We are not seeing it drawing you towards reading the word of God more. We are not seeing it drawing you towards fasting more. Praise the Lord. We are not seeing you appreciating that the devil is roaming around looking for someone to devour. And that person at that point might be you who is being devoured. We are not seeing you waging a spiritual warfare as you should, as stated in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10, against this particular kind of sin. Amen? Amen. All we are seeing is you are closing yourself in the room, three minutes of telling God you are sorry, ten minutes of crying, then you come out clean. We now wait for you to be the clean person who has come out from the closet. Amen? Your understanding of what repentance is must go deeper than that. Amen? Amen. And this understanding of repentance should begin by understanding what God's mercy is for a believer. Praise the Lord. When you are going to ask God for forgiveness, you need to understand what am I going to seek. As you go to seek the mercies of God, you need to also understand what is the mercy of God. What is this thing that I'm going to seek from God? Praise the Lord. When scripture says in Hebrews that now with the curtain when it was broken into two, when Christ died, and the wall of partition that was there was divided, and now we have access to the throne of mercy that we may find grace and mercy and help and favor in times of need what does that mean for you as a believer 
Because unless you understand what the mercy of God is, you will continue with your crying and your resolutions and you will never change from that sin. Amen? Amen. You will keep on writing in that notebook and you will write and you will write and you will write and it will be full of the sins that are known unto you. Because there are those many that are, known, that are not known unto you that you did. And you will not move away from that sin. Because every time you go there, what you think or you imagine about God is to just tell him. It is, you are not re really repenting. You are making God aware that you have sinned as if he does not know. Amen? You are going to tell God, God, today I slept around and I am really sorry. Did he, at the time you are conceiving that thought of sleeping around, God already knew that you are going to sleep around. Praise the Lord. So we are not in the business of informing God about our sins. Amen? Because he already knows them. Praise the Lord. Even though he tells us to confess our sins, he's not telling us because he's unaware. He's simply telling us that in that confession, are we appreciating his mercy and truly appreciating his grace? Amen? Praise the Lord. I want to read us a verse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, chapter 12, verse 9 to 10. It says that, and he said unto me, um, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen? That is Paul appreciating what God's mercy is. That is Paul appreciating when I am going to God to repent my sin, what exactly am I doing? Praise the Lord. Paul is saying that I am appreciating my weakness so that the excellency of Christ, the power of Christ may rest upon me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you've started to think about your sins, it's okay. If you had planned to cry today, you know some of us, we schedule repentance. Like you just sin, then you are okay. Then you say, today night, this is the sin I will repent. So you wait for at night when you are praying. Praise the Lord. And then that's when you repent. Like all this time, you've just been okay. You did your sin at 10 a.m., but you have just told it to remain there. At 10 p.m., you are going to meet with God to tell God sorry. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, some of these things you do sometimes because you don't understand the gospel. Amen? Because you don't understand who Christ is. We don't fully comprehend who Christ is. But this is what the mercy of God is. This is what you, the attitude that you should have when you are going to God in repentance. First of all, is to understand that the grace of God is sufficient. Amen? That is the grace that teaches you to say no to every form of ungodliness and unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. You must understand that God's grace is able to teach you and to empower you to overcome sin. Praise the Lord. What that will do to you is that when you leave your, when you are done with your repentance, it is God that is glorified in his ability to keep you from falling, as scripture will say. Amen? It is not your resolution to not fall again. Praise the Lord. That is you trusting in the arm of flesh which will fail. It is not your tears. 
It is not you are feeling sorry. It is the grace of God that you need to listen and to be taught of and to appreciate for you to not fall again into that sin. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That is why you can write all the strategies you have for not sleeping with that person again. You will never allow him to send you chips again. You won't be in his house by 8 p.m. You will have gone. You will not meet in enclosed places. All those things are good. Praise the Lord. They are good. They are good things to, to write and to decide you will not do. If maybe you are struggling with pornography, you even uh, reformat your whole operating system, you can even sell that laptop with the pornography and buy another and start a clean slate. As if the sin is in that laptop. Amen? The sin is not in the laptop. The sin is not in the night. Amen? The sin is not in the chips that was used to bring you closer. Praise the Lord. The sin is in you. Amen? So unless you die to self, no amount of mechanical strategies are going to save you from falling into sin. Amen? Amen. When scripture says things like flee from sexual immorality, it does not say just physically run. You know, some of these teachers have cheated you. They have told you, you see how Joseph physically ran. Praise the Lord. What took Joseph from that room was not his legs. Praise the Lord. It was the fear of God. Amen. So when it tells you to flee from sexual immorality, it is telling you to guard your heart. It is telling you to have the fear of the Lord. It is telling you to grow and be deeply rooted in Christ. Amen. So the next time you think that Joseph ran away because his feet were strong, and because he reacted in the, in the right time, you just tell that pastor or whoever is telling you that whatever took Joseph from that room was the fear of the Lord. Amen? Maybe even Joseph did not realize when he was outside, he was outside. But because his heart was set upon the Lord, he flew from that room. Praise the Lord. Whatever made David uh, rather Daniel not to eat of the things of the king was not just a resolution but it because the purpose in his heart was driven by the fear of the Lord. Amen? The knowledge of who God is. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are we together? So the next time you think that all your mechanical ideas will make you flee you are playing with fire. Amen? You must appreciate that the grace of God is sufficient for you. You must leave that room of repentance saying, I, I do not know how I will manage to stay away from this sin, but I know that the grace of God will carry me through. Praise the Lord. And live like someone who is being carried through by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Because you can't be writing resolutions and being prayerless. And every time you pray, your prayer is repenting. And you pray once every four days. When your sin is back, you pray. When your sin is back, you pray. You go and Google verses on feeling down. Because now you have sinned. Praise the Lord. Yani, you know some of you, if the internet was not there, if you people lived in the first century, I don't know how you would survive. Because in those days, there was no place to Google Verses when you are feeling bad about your sin. Praise the Lord. Now these things you do sometimes. God is merciful. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's not about you going to Google and trying to find and opening your Bible and searching repentance and then you feel touched by that verse. It's not about you engaging your emotions. Amen. It is you appreciating who God is. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities. Glory here in his infirmities. Paul is not saying that he will rather show off his sin. Praise the Lord. But he's saying that he appreciates the existence of these things in him. Amen? 
And he goes on in another place to say that whatever thing I want to do, I do not. Amen? And that which I do not want to do, I do. And then he says, why does that happen? Because of the man who he is, the outer fleshy man, that is after the things of darkness. But he goes on to say, but now because I am a new creation, I seek after the new man. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. So that you don't use that verse and say, I didn't want to do, but I did just like Paul. Paul is ending there by saying that he seeks and he feeds the spirit man. Praise the Lord. So therefore, as you appreciate God's grace, you must see your weaknesses as, an, as a glorification of your need for Christ. Amen? You must see your weaknesses as a reminder that you need Christ. Praise the Lord. And that thing must be glorious in your sight. You must, you must love it. You must love the fact that when I sin, it is only Christ who will save me from this sin. Amen? Because the outcome of that is that it leads you to obedience. Amen? It ultimately will always lead you to obedience. Because when Christ sees that you have shown the need for him, he will surely strengthen you and save you from that sin. But if you are fighting it by your own self, you will fail. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Praise the Lord. Christ is calling you to appreciate and truly so your need for him. Praise the Lord. Christ is calling you to appreciate his grace. To see yourself as being unable to overcome that sin without him. And that will help you to take up the armor of Christ, as Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 will say. That will help you to live in obedience to Christ. Amen? So that when you leave that room for repentance, you live with a confidence that Christ has taken away your sin. Amen? You live with the confidence that he has forgiven you and that he will fight your battle. You only need to bless your faith and trust and hope in him. Praise the Lord. And to understand that it is a continuous process of sanctification. Amen? When you have gotten to the bottom of, the, of everything, when you are feeling like now you have done all the sins that everyone has done in this world, that is not enough. You must appreciate that at that particular point, only the grace of God can restore to you the joy of salvation. Amen? Like what we see David doing in Psalms chapter 51, when he had already um, sinned against God. It was an appreciation that he had sinned against God, that the the being that was hurt the most was not him, but was God, because he had put God to shame. And it is only in God that he had hoped to find restitution and forgiveness for his sin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So if you have a book that you have written your sins, just go and burn it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise that sana sana was chan. I go and know me when I can How many men have diaries? Unless you have a talent of writing, you cannot have a diary. Now, the more you grow old as, as men, you come to learn that ladies even schedule their times to cry. So a girl can just know today when I go to the house I will cry. 
and she will go and cry. You people, it's not a joke. You don't know. Ah, am I saying the truth, ladies? Senior Queen. They said you tend to cry. By the way, it's very serious. This crying business. Man, when we are talking as couples, sometimes in church we usually say there are two things that you should not touch the date for baby shower and the time for crying. Those two things do not touch them, just leave them. If you have any other business on the date of baby shower, postpone and leave it for baby shower. And if you go to the room and hear your wife is crying, do not interrupt because she might even cry louder. The interruption might make the situation worse. So you just leave her to cry and come out of the room and you pretend you've not heard. You pretend you've not heard. But you cannot tell her, had you really been praying a strong prayer? We are safe. She was crying, I had other problems. Praise the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. It says, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. It is of whose mercy? The Lord's mercy. Praise the Lord. So when you are repenting, when you are seeking for forgiveness from God, when you think that by you telling God you won't do it again, or when you think that by you having a resolution not to do it again, that you are averting the anger of God, that is false. Praise the Lord. The anger of the Lord is averted from you by the virtue of God's mercy. Amen? By the virtue of his compassion. Not by the virtue of how resolute you are towards not sinning again. Amen? Not by the virtue of you selling your laptop that has some wicked things. Not by the virtue of you saying you will follow the 10 to 10 rule. Praise the Lord. It is by the virtue of God's mercy that his anger is averted from you. So if that is what averts God's anger from you, then what you should seek the most is that mercy. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. And it goes on to say that they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait on him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That should be your attitude towards repentance. Praise the Lord. To hope and wait for the salvation of the Lord. To not tire from seeking the forgiveness of God. And that is what Christ talks about in that parable of that unjust judge, praise the Lord, and that lady, the widow, who always went to the judge until the judge listened to that widow. How much more Christ, praise the Lord, how much more you waiting and hoping upon the Lord for his salvation, for his deliverance from your sin. Praise the Lord. But remember what scripture is saying, that the Lord is good not only to them that wait on him, but to the soul that seeks the Lord. Amen? Amen. The mercies of God, in as much as they are new every morning, they are not beneficial to you if you are not seeking the Lord. Amen? If you are not in prayer, if you are not in reading the word of God, if you are not in fellowship, if you are not in fasting, if you are not in communion with God, the new masses of God every morning, to you, they might not be beneficial. Praise the Lord. Amen. So if you are struggling with that sin, you are waiting upon the Lord, you are hoping upon the Lord, is only manifested in you are seeking of him. Amen? Amen? In you waging a war against that sin. Not a physical war, a prayerful war. Praise the Lord. Not the ten steps, not the ten points, not the resolutions, 
Not the diary that you have written on how you will not go back to that house again. It is you waging the war and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Praise the Lord. Because the sin is in you. Amen? The sin is in you. It is not in those other things. So the thing that you should be fighting the most is that evil desire. It is that what Paul says that no one is tempted by God for everyone when they are tempted, they are tempted by their own evil desire. It is that which tells you that is in you, your evil desire, that you need to wage sin against. Praise the Lord. It is not that room where you fall, that you say, now me, I will never go there. Praise the Lord. When you see whole six and you are a lady, because now you are fighting sin. You cannot go near all six because that is where you fell. As you go to Kengo Gate, you are going with the sin. Praise the Lord. So it is better you fight it because it is in you. Amen? Praise the Lord. If you as a man, you are watching porn that you are introduced to your friends, and you say you are cutting off your friends, that is well and good. But the sin that you should wage war against remains with you. Praise the Lord. It does not go with those friends that you cut off. Amen? Just as we have to say that it is a, a war against two countries. You are arming yourself physically to fight that war. Amen? If it is about how you dress, you can go to Gikomba and buy all the long dresses. Longer dresses than the dresses of nuns. Praise the Lord. But the sin is not in those dresses. The sin is in you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You use a lot of your strength to fight sin. Your physical strength. Praise the Lord. But Christ is calling us to just seek Him. Amen? Just try praying every morning against this sin. Just try fasting against this sin. Just try reading the Word of God and see what the outcome of that will be. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now we usually say sometimes you might pray in the morning and or rather you might purpose in the morning as a man to not to not last. And that is the day you will last like nobody's business. You will even ask yourself whether your purposing was purposeful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And these things are real. Amen? Amen. These things are real. You can wake up in the morning and say me today. I'm not looking at any girl twice. The border border will hit you there looking behind. By the time you get to your house, three, two thirds of the journey you have been looking behind, standing your head around. Because you think that is how you need to. When, 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 when you are in that moment, and then you say in your head, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to die, and then you die. <laughs> because you think, because now at that point you have said in the name of Jesus, now you're okay, and you have not been praying for three weeks. You now feel you will overcome it at that time. Amen? If you are not seeking the Lord, it will not happen. Praise the Lord. James 1 verse 12 to 15, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, Neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Praise the Lord. I hope you are seeing the language of James here, that it is in you. Praise the Lord. It is in you. It is that lust that ultimately brings forth sin and that sin that brings forth death. But he is reminding us that you must endure that temptation and you will endure 
by seeking the Lord, by your eyes being firmly set upon the Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Hebrews will say that we look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And it continues and continues and it talks about how Christ or God chastises the ones that he loves. Praise the Lord. When the Lord is taking you through that moment of immense grief, that moment of immense sorrow, that moment where with, with groanings that cannot utter a word, praise the Lord, with groanings that cannot even shed a tear, that heaviness that there is nothing physical that is showing it, but inwardly you are burning from that guilt of sin, the Lord is working on you. Praise the Lord. Amen? That time when you are overburdened by it, that time when you feel like you have come to the end of it, and you are truly seeking Christ, it is godly sorrow that now is being born in you. Praise the Lord. Any sorrow that happens outside of, of, of you praying and seeking the Lord earnestly is false humility. Praise the Lord. And do not let that false humility cheat you that you are repenting. Amen? Don't let that thing that makes you feel you are broken and yet you are not seeking the Lord make you think that you are repenting. Praise the Lord. You cannot be prayerless for a whole year and then you fall into a serious sin and then you come out there telling us that you feel like the Lord has worked on you. Where? It is not possible. Amen? The Lord will work on you when you are in his presence. Praise the Lord. When you are consistently seeking him, when you are consistently in his hands, him molding you with his hands and chastising you, and when the Lord has worked on you, we shall see it in your discipline, in your fellowship with God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And therefore our perseverance and our endurance is rooted upon the fact that Christ is molding us. Amen? Sometimes when we talk about perseverance and endurance, you might confuse it to think that when you are in that sea, just keep on persevering to get out of it. Praise the Lord. That is not what scripture is saying. Amen? So that when we find you, you are struggling with sin, you say, guys, me, I'm struggling with pornography, uh, but I'm still fighting it. Praise the Lord. That is not what scripture is saying. And I want you guys to get me right. When the Bible says that blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. It's not saying that that man who is in that sin, and he is saying, me, I'm in this sin, I am just fighting against it. No, the endurance is the concept of Hebrews that you are in the hands of God and God is molding you. Praise the Lord. And that chast chastening of you is not pleasant, as scripture says. Amen? Now, your living of that sin is as an outcome of God chastening you. Praise the Lord. It's not as an outcome of you waging a physical war in that sin. Amen? Are we together? Because sometimes people are comfortable in their sin. Oh, me, I'm struggling with pornography, but I know God is going to help me. Yes, we know God will help you, but are you in the hands of the Lord? Praise the Lord. Is he just telling you? Is he molding you? Are you feeling like he's calling you to a life of sacrifice? 
Praise the Lord. Are you feeling like he's calling you to more devotion? So that when we are told that blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. This is not a man that is losing the battle against temptation. Amen? This is not a man that is comfortable in the sin as a result of that temptation. This is a man that is gaining victory against that sin. Praise the Lord. This is a man that the Lord is chastening. Are we together? Praise the Lord. So that you are not just comfortable in your sin and say, me, I'm waiting for the Lord here. I know I'm masturbating. You're even ticking days. I missed this one. I got that one. The chastening of the Lord, the endurance is as an outcome of the chastening of the Lord. And the endurance, the only outcome for that endurance is what James is saying, that when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Why? Because he will be victorious. Praise the Lord. And finally, Galatians chapter 5, Miliadua 550. Speakers from Kwanga to Kwenda Alam, because when you titi titi to Nachia, play Mesha, come and record Nasema and Nachia for and don't escape the word to Nafil. Praise the Lord. But then this is a lot of things to teach in 45 minutes. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. Then I say, walk in the spirit and fulfill not the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. This is a man who is enduring. Praise the Lord. Why? Because he's walking in the spirit, which is at war against the flesh. Praise the Lord. But some of us, when we say we are enduring, we are just walking in the flesh. Amen? And we are saying we are enduring. We are not. Your endurance should be characterized by you walking in the spirit. It should be characterized by you being chastened by the Lord. The only possible outcome for a Christian who is truly enduring is victory. Praise the Lord. Victory over the sin. Victory over that temptation. Victory over that addiction. That is the only possible outcome for a believer. Because Christ has said that he has already done what? Overcome the world. Praise the Lord. He sends us forth with that confidence that he has overcome the world. You cannot trust in God and fail in it. We don't know how long it will take. That is the work of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. But what we know is that victory is assured. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So the next time you are seeking repentance from God, remember to understand what is this mercy that I am seeking from the Lord. Amen? And wage a spiritual war against your sin. And be confident that God is not a tyrant waiting to throw you to hell as a believer. Amen? He has already said that his desire is to grant you his kingdom. Praise the Lord. Have that confidence that victory is assured. What is needed from you is obedience. Amen? Let's believe and pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you have Hold us as your children who have told us that you have set us apart as a royal priesthood, a holy people. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to have confidence always in you and that you will help us, Almighty Father, to not wage using physical and mechanical means, but to know that the battle is in the spirit. Help us to walk in the spirit. Help us to endure the chastening that you do unto us often as you mold us. Help us even the more to have this confidence that you have assured us of victory against sin. For this we ask in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.